Good afternoon, everyone. And welcome to Federation Hall. My name's David Sequeira. I'm the director of the Theatre and Sydney Maya Gallery. And I'm also the person who coordinates um, Art Forum. And before I introduce our guest speaker, Zena Cumston, I do want to take a moment and invite you to join me in grounding yourself in the deep knowledge that long before the BCA or the University of Melbourne was even thought of, that generations of the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation practiced song and dance here. They made paintings and sculptures. They practiced healing. They shared stories on this land. And it's with great joy and honor that we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. Our speaker today, Zena Cumston, is a Bakunji woman with family connections to Broken Hill and Menindi in Western New South Wales. Zena works predominantly as a writer, curator and researcher and is passionate about truth telling and undertaking projects that directly benefit her community and country. Most recently, she's the curator of the show Emu Sky at the Old Quad at the University of Melbourne, which brings together more than 30 Aboriginal community members from across Southeastern Australia. Uh, next month, um, Zena's book, Plants, Past, Present and Future Conversations, which is co-authored with Professor Leslie Head and Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher will be released as part of the first Knowledges series of publications. Wherever you are in Zoom land or in Federation Hall, please make Zena very welcome. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I also want to acknowledge traditional custodians, the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people. Um, I live on Wurundjeri country and I work on Wurundjeri country. And you'll see today, um, I'm mostly going to talk about a show that I've curated called Emu Sky, um, which is on our old quad at the University of Melbourne Parkfield campus at the moment. I'm really honoured to be here and um, I want to thank David and June for having me and everyone um, at BCA. Uh, I often watch the, the um, recordings of these talks and it's wonderful to be included with such esteemed people. Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, so I also want to acknowledge any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are here today um, and also people who might be joining us on Zoom. How are you and your elders and your future leaders? Um, and I just wanted to, I guess, uh, place myself as an Aboriginal person and uh, talk a little bit about my belonging. So I'm a Barkindji woman from Western New South Wales. Um, most of my family now live in Menindee and Broken Hill. So I'm descended from Mary Eileen Payne, who was born in Wilcannia. And she actually married an Afghan camelier called Khan Zayda. And they moved to Broken Hill, uh, I think in the early 1900s. But um, Granny Mary kept her connection to her Bakunji mob and Mulcanya through um, having a house in Broken Hill at the Camel Camp, where she regularly um, had people coming and going. So she apparently had two huge black pots that she had in the backyard and they were always boiling because there was no mobiles, obviously, and often no way of telling people that you're on your way because the Cameliers worked, you know, right across vast tracts of land. Um, and there was always a feed at her house. And, the community that came to the hospital from Wilcannia and her Barkindji mob would come to her house and stay. And that's part of the oral history of my family, but also um, I've read about it in books and she's going to her community through that ongoing connection of a safe place when the hospital didn't really allow people to get proper care. And usually um, they had to leave quickly from the hospital and it gave them a place to sort of convalesce at her house. So I'm very proud of that history. Um, so, as David said, um, I work mostly as a writer and a curator and a storyteller, as well as a researcher. It's kind of getting ridiculous, um, the amount of titles that I've got in my name, but it's really a big part of me, the, um, the amount of spaces that I end up being in, because I've just never been very good at sticking to my lane. Um, <clears throat> so... For the last four or so years, I've actually been working in science faculty at the University of Melbourne, and I'm not a scientist, but I've been really interested in Aboriginal plant use, and especially in the ways that plant use is really a wonderful way of helping people to understand the depth and the breadth of our knowledge of country as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. 
um, it's been a wonderful portal as well to be able to share with younger people, which I've tried to incorporate in all of my research work. I'm also not officially an academic, um, so I kind of end up in all these spaces I'm not supposed to be in. <clears throat> and a friend a couple of years ago told me that I'd never sort of be as successful as I should be with how hard I work because I can't pick a lane and I need to choose. Am I going to do this or am I going to do that? Are you going to do your art stuff, she said, or are you going to you know, try and get into academia? And I've kind of realised that whilst I really respect her um, and her trajectory in life, I think I'll never be able to just be a person that's just in one realm. And I really like storytelling more than anything else. And so for me, my, I guess, main imperative is to be a person that not only can be a facilitator for my own stories, but for my mob as well. And so that means that I'm going to jump in and out of spaces that some people probably think I shouldn't be in, like academia when I've only got an undergrad and science faculty when I'm not a scientist, which Andrew Bolt recently pointed out on national television, which was wonderful because it was something I had actually noticed in the past that I was not a scientist, but um, it was kind of funny that he was laughing at me for being part of something that I'll show you um, because I'm not a scientist. But yeah, I think it's really good for all of us to think about the silos, especially in knowledge production. There's a really big problem, I think, in the way that knowledge is produced when people are told to stick to their lane. Collaborations are a wonderful way of producing knowledge. And I think we're still, we talk about them a lot and they're embedded in our processes within um, academia, but I think they're not as powerful as they should be because unfortunately academia still teaches people from an extremely Western perspective that they have to be at the peak of their lane and the best, and they have to be the expert. And sometimes that doesn't make us collaborate in ways that's actually really meaningful because people you know, are still having to be within a system where they almost have to jostle against each other to be at the top. We need to think about the way that academia plays out and smarter ways of producing knowledge, I think, in the structures that we have. And certainly the structures that we have within academia are still extremely problematic for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to fit within because we do look at things much more holistically and we don't silo information and knowledge. And so it's really like trying to put a square peg into a round hole at times and it can be extremely frustrating. So I'm happy to be all over the place because it means that I can... Um, I can tell stories in a more holistic way. Um, next slide, please, Jean. So I've already done that one, so we might flick to the next one. So um, David asked me to talk about some of the themes that um, underpin my work. So I guess the main one for me is that I'm choosing projects that empower Aboriginal people and country. In the past, I did projects that were with lots of Aboriginal community members, and I slowly came to realise that they a lot of the time, not all of the time, we're actually providing much more benefit to non-Aboriginal people than they were to Aboriginal people. Um, and that was a big turning point for me. And the last five years or so, I've worked really hard to make sure that every project I take on really, really carefully calibrates at the start what benefit it's going to bring to people. And I try really hard to make sure that that's foregrounded. I'm always happy when heaps of people get benefit, but I have to work at the moment to make sure that it's my mob that get the most because all of our systems are kind of set up to be extremely extractive, I think. And so I'm always thinking what benefit is there right at the start of projects. I'm also really interested in Aboriginal plant use, as I said, um, and in illuminating Indigenous knowledge and especially through that exploration of plant use. I'm interested in intellectual and cultural property rights for my people. Um, it's not an area I have expertise in, but it's something that I'm really passionate about and that I really try to embed into the work that I'm doing. I'm also really interested in food sovereignty. Um, and I think it's a really exciting area at the moment in Australia. We still you know, haven't really even started opening up conversations properly, but I think especially with the march of climate change, food sovereignty is something that we all need to really start getting across a bit more because it's, um, it's going to be something that is really important in our future in terms of how we adapt to survive to some of the things that, to survive some of the things that we're coming up against. Um, and I'm really interested in the intersection between colonisation and climate change, um, which I think is something that we've probably all thought about at some points. But I really see, um, you know, without having hours to talk, that until we can undo the ongoing circumstance of colonisation or begin to at least slow the machine of colonisation, we are not going to be able to 
um, meet the challenges of climate change in the way that we need to, because they are definitely related, especially in the way that our knowledge of country plays out in management. We don't really get to have a say a lot of the time. Um, next slide, please. So um, I started to see um, more the intersection of my research and my old life as a performer um, and how important it is to get your work out to an audience when I was a collaborator on the show Buna Bunanga, Aboriginal Agriculture in the Southeast by Dr. Jonathan Jones. And that was at the Tanindi Festival, which my big sister Nikki Cumpson is the director of at the Art Gallery of South Australia, which is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander festival. I was so thrilled to be a part of that show and I was the tiniest, tiniest part. I will not overstate my role. It was Jonathan's baby and he worked really closely with Bill Gamage and Uncle Bruce Pascoe. It was a visual representation of a lot of the ideas that were unfolded through um, both of those authors' books about land management. And I guess um, really opening up some dialogues that hadn't been properly understood for the longest time about the depth and breadth of our knowledge of country and the way that we've managed it. And so with that show, I just saw people's reaction to it and how, um, how important it was for further conversations. And I started thinking about the research work I was doing and I realized that the research work I was doing was completely aligned to all of the narratives within this show, um, which is why Jonathan allowed me to have a tiny part in it. But yeah, I sort of thought about the work that I was doing and I felt that it wasn't getting out to a wide enough audience. So because of that, um, I kind of thought about going back into the arts a little bit if I, if I got the opportunity. I kind of put it in my head that if something comes up and I can tell an audience to a, a, tell a story to an audience like this that's really important to me and my people, then I'm going to take it because I had been in the arts um, <clears throat> from a very young age. Um, I was an actor for 10 years and a producer and worked a lot in the arts and then I just completely left it and didn't do anything in the arts at all. So yeah, it was this show that sort of made me plant that sort of seed in my mind about wanting to perhaps engage in the arts again because it's such a wonderful um, platform to be able to reach a lot of people more so than the research I was doing at the time. Um, next slide please, Jean. So this is just a picture I added um, because I absolutely love it. It kind of incorporates three people who I really admire. So um, Jonathan Jones, who um, made Buna Bunaga and was the curator of that show, and Uncle Badger Bates, who's an elder from my community, who has given me a lot of his time. And when I go home, he um, most often will take me and family members and whoever's with us out on country and teach us something pretty amazing or lots of amazing things. So. Um, I really admire him and his energy and he's a culture warrior on my country because we've had some really, really horrific problems with our Barker, which is the Darling River, um, just through mismanagement and bastardry and theft. And Uncle Badger has been really pivotal in getting that message out to a really wide audience uh, about what's happened to our Barker. And the photo itself was taken um, by an amazing photographer, um, an Aboriginal woman called Jo Drysons, who um, I really, really love. So yeah, there's lots of aspects to that picture I like. I wanted to include it. And they're both looking at Bonabunaga, which I thought was lovely watching them talking about all of the items because Uncle Badger and Jonathan are really keen carvers. So when they get together, they just kind of talk a lot about carving, which is great if you're not stuck in a car going to Wilcannia with them, which I was once. And it was lovely to listen to for the first 25 minutes, but they're really into like their tools and stuff. And I'm not a carver, so yeah. <laughs> Um, next slide, please, June. This is a project I did, I think it was in 2019. It was at the University of Melbourne when I first was employed here. Um, it was either 18 or 19, I think it was 19. And it was called The Living Pavilion. And um, I was the lead researcher and one of the producers of that event. And I guess, um, basically, we got 40,000 Indigenous plants and we put them into a space at the Parkfield campus. And I did lots of research around those plants and their cultural belonging. And we put the, the research on the signs and lots of people came and read the signs and um, were uh, really excited by the information about the plants. And I, it was a turning point for me because I didn't realise that, that all of this information and all of the research that I'd done wasn't something, I guess I did realise, but it just really hit home that 
people really don't know a lot about our plants and the cultural stories and the, the um, scientific practice embedded within them. And just watching people, I was told that the signs were way too much and that they had too much information on and they needed to sort of be cut in half. And I dug in, as I often do, when I really have a gut feeling that something's very important. And we ended up with these signs that were, you know, probably too long. But being at the site a lot, I realised that people were staying for an hour and a half sometimes to read them. And I went, ah, there's something here. Next slide, please. So out of um, that experience of just that two-week pop-up, which was called the Living Pavilion, um, I decided to put that research into something that was accessible for all people, but especially for community groups and uh, childcare centres and kinders, which I noticed because I have young children nowadays, uh, doing lots of bush garden sort of engagement. So they're making bush gardens and they're also talking about the plants that are out there and wanting children to have opportunities to be outside. Um, on country more and so I made this booklet to help people understand um, the the cultural stories of the plants and what plants grow best here and so that project the Living Pavilion was really centered around the Kulin Nation but actually there are many plants right across the southeast which have a lot of similarities and sometimes you know exactly the same uses and so some of the plants that I showcased through that work are actually plants from my Barkinshire country as well like river mint, which is one of my favourite plants, and kangaroo grass. Um, so across the southeast, we have lots of similarities in country, and therefore we have lots of similarities in plants. So whilst I was specifically talking about cool and nation plants in this booklet, um, there's also lots of plants that grow across a wide area, um, and there's information that I hope you know, it's easy for children to understand. It's very much abbreviated from what I originally did, but um, it's been very popular. It's a free online booklet. So if you want to access it, you just put in Indigenous Plant Use in my name or the Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub, Call Hub. Um, that's who I worked for as part of the National Environmental Science Program and who funded the work that I did with that. But yeah, it's been lovely to put something out in the world that people have obviously enjoyed. And um, I don't engage in social media because it's the devil's playground but um, I have heard that it's been big shared like with people so that's good yeah next slide please so um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, the national um, the state of the environment report 2021 which came out a couple of weeks ago and I promise I'm not going to bore you to death with any disaster porn um, but I just wanted to talk about it because I was one of the Indigenous authors that worked on the report, which is something that I'm really, really proud of. But I just wanted to talk about it a little bit in terms of, I guess, my imperative to get things out to a wide audience and why I'm doing so much different work. So I might have been working on Emu Sky two days a week, which was what I was mostly employed for. And then the other three, sometimes four, sometimes five days a week, um, I was working on the State of the Environment report. And... It's the first time that Indigenous authors have been included, um, which is really shocking. Uh, but it was a really wonderful experience because I got to work with other mob who have exactly the same ideas as I do. And I think, you know, underscoring all of my work is an absolute love of country and my deep responsibility to it. And so working on this was such an honour because I got to do research and to tell stories in a really tangible way because we wanted to make it a document that was very much for anyone who wanted to read it and easy to understand, so not academic writing that kind of disappears up its own creek. And it was really lovely to be able to tell those stories in that way. Um, and so I encourage you to have a look at the State of the Environment Report. Um, I wrote on the Indigenous, the Urban and the Heritage chapter. And actually I was doing a lot of this writing at exactly the same time as I was doing writing for Emu Sky. And when I go to Emu Sky after revisiting the report, because it was finally released a couple of weeks ago after Susan Lay, the koala killer, kept it on her desk for about six months as the environment minister, um, it just got finally released. And it's wonderful to have it out in the world. Um, and I think it's a really great resource for people. And especially there's a new chapter, the Indigenous chapter. Um, and I got to write that with some amazing writers, but also with Dr. Cherry, Terry Janke, who for a long time has been someone that I really, really look up to. She's at the forefront of intellectual and cultural property rights law in Australia. She writes a lot of the protocols and guidelines for most of the arts organisations. And yeah, she's an amazing person. And it was a, an incredible experience to work with her on this. 
and to be able to engage my storytelling skills to bring people in to what is really scientific discourse we so often have to bury our heads in the sand because things are not um, conveyed in a way that we can understand our place and understand you know what the positive that can come and what we can do and I think there's so many scientists doing really wonderful work, but I think we still have a really long way to go in terms of the way that science is communicated. And I absolutely um, think that I, um, I was a good person for this job because I think um, I and the other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander writers on the report understand storytelling, understand bringing people in and, and trying to get that story out in a way that reaches a, a large audience. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, these are um, the mob that I worked with and all the countries that they're from. And next slide, please, June. Um, so I probably don't need to say any more about that other than, other than to say, I think all of us in all the work that we're doing, we have to um, work as hard as we can to foreground country and to find ways of taking our place as custodians because we're not all traditional custodians but we are all custodians and I think that's a really big call within the, the State of the Environment Report 2021 is that we all have a responsibility and it's not all bad news there are so many things that we can do together if we choose to foreground country in our work and I've really chosen to foreground it in all of my work and I hope um, I hope people can feel empowered even though the story in the report is sometimes really, really disheartening and traumatic. There are things that we can all do and the report actually says that the best science today tells us that there is so much we can do to help the environment. If we can find our place as custodians and realise that we can't wait for other people, we all have to take our place big or small to do something. Next slide, please. So Emu Sky um, is a show that I curated um, at Old Quad at the University of Melbourne, and it was a co-production between um, Science Gallery Melbourne, the Clean Air Urban Landscapes Hub that I used to work for, um, and also Ian Potter um, and Cultural Commons. There was lots of people and groups involved, and I encourage you to go onto the Emu Sky website because, um, to be honest, I've just recovered from COVID and I am very foggy, so I might not be talking about all the things I'm supposed to, but there's a great page of acknowledgements that we put together to make sure that, you know, everyone who worked on this was properly acknowledged. Um, it was a really important show for me. Um, I'm not actually, you know, seen as a curator, but I was happy to take that role because I have worked as a curator before, as an assistant curator. And I think if you're a storyteller who's passionate, you can be a curator for a project because it's really ultimately about choosing the story that gets told. Amy Sky really for me is a story about um, empowering Aboriginal people to speak about their perspective of country. It was first actually envisaged as a co-production between the Herbarium um, and Science Gallery in Melbourne. And I went to the Herbarium and I looked um, all through the collections for a couple of weeks, both um, online and in person. And unfortunately, I couldn't see anything that had been collected in the uh, 180 so years of that collection's life that reflected Indigenous knowledge or even spoke about it in any tangible way at all. And so I had to really think again, as I was talking before, about what, what, what benefit would this bring my Aboriginal community? To tell a story about a gaping hole would be wonderful for the herbarium and I'm not a mean-spirited person. I would be very happy for them to have that as part of their ongoing um, collection, but there wasn't enough benefit that I could see for Aboriginal community in that collaboration. And so I went back to Science Gallery and I wrote a big um, letter and had lots of discussions. And luckily for me, they um, allowed us to pivot the focus of the show and for it to be more stories that artists um, are commissioned to, to tell from whatever foundation they chose, not just that herbarium collection, which really was a big black hole. Next slide, please. Um, so this is all about what Amy Sky is all about. And I put it up because my brain's not working very well at the moment. And I thought it'd be good for people to be able to see it without me stumbling through, but I'll just read a tiny bit of it. So. Uh, Emu Sky opens conversations about what we continue to risk in failing to recognise and empower Indigenous knowledge and sustainable practice in the ongoing management of country. Made for all ages, the exhibition offers illuminations and invites an opportunity to listen 
and that's the website underneath there as well. Next slide, please. Annie Joy Murphy Wanden um, is an artist in the show, but she also is someone um, who I work with whenever I can, um, which is never enough because she's always doing lots and lots of projects. She's a Wurundjeri Woiwurrung leader and knowledge holder. And she really helped me a lot with this project in terms of cultural safety, not just for me, but for all of the artists. There are lots of Wurundjeri Woiwurrung artists in this show, which I'm really, really proud of because we're on Woiwurrung um, country there. Um, at the Parkville campus at Old Quad. But yeah, Annie Joy was just really open to um, me being able to touch base with her. And also she offered a lot of advice and guidance throughout the process. And I'm absolutely thrilled that some of her work is part of the show because um, I think she's a really important person in the Victorian Aboriginal landscape. And I feel really honoured that she gives me her time. Next slide, please. So Annie Joy's work in the show is, um, it's like a, uh, there's a soundscape where she welcomes the audience, which is really important uh, from a cultural standpoint. And then she's also made this beautiful work, which is actually what, what it's about what Wurundjeri means. And I encourage you to come to the show before it finishes on August 21, if you haven't been, um, because as I said, there's lots of, um, there's over 30 Aboriginal uh, contributors to the show but there's quite a few um, Wurundjeri Woiwurrung artists showcased and it's wonderful to have that opportunity to have a deeper understanding, um, you know, about a group on whose country you're, you're traversing. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, next one, please. Um, there were, I can't go through all of the slides, obviously, and I'm probably going to have to finish up soon. So we've got time for some questions, but um, Genevieve Greaves, who's on the far end here, um, she mentored me on the show. And Genevieve is an incredible culture warrior and someone I really look up to. She's one of the um, many people behind the First Peoples um, Bunjalaka um, exhibition, which is a permanent exhibition at um, Melbourne Museum, which really teaches in a really um, beautiful way uh, all about Kulin nations and what, it, what those different mobs um, have been through over time and what people are doing today. It's a really wonderful exhibition and it's permanent. So if you haven't seen it, it'd be great to go down and have a look because again, it gives you a really great understanding of this specific place and its cultural context. Um, this is a picture that was taken when Genevieve Mandy Nicholson, who's an incredible culture warrior in um, Wurundjeri community and Stacey um, Piper, went out on country with the Jiri Jiri dancers and they made an absolutely beautiful film called Babang Dabang, which means mother tree. And it's all about the way that we as Aboriginal people look after each other and share knowledge. And it's really, I guess, showing Mandy as that um, mountain ash and the way that she is funneling her energy and her knowledge through um, the roots down to those younger, um, those younger people in the landscape. Uh, next slide, please. So that's um, the mob there. And there was lots of parts of Amy Sky that were like this, where people got to go out on country and make their work. And that's really, really important to me as part of my practice. So often we're expected as Aboriginal people to be performative and everything's kind of for a white audience. Um, in some ways, you know, we're expected to have these outcomes that everyone sees and that really displays our culture. But actually it's really important for us to always have cultural grounding and to have these opportunities to be together that aren't performative just to make our work in a way that's um, important to us, but allows us all to also to regenerate ourselves culturally because constantly having to like share your culture can be really, really draining. And so it was really great to have some of the projects that were part of Amy's Sky give that opportunity for revitalization for people in their communities. Next slide, please. Um, I won't talk about this because I'm running out of time. I might go to the next one, please, Jean. Sorry if I'm driving you crazy. And maybe next one. Um, so these pieces here are by Associate Professor Michael Sean Fletcher, who is a Wiradjuri man, but also works at the University of Melbourne. I can't remember exactly what he's called. It's something like a paleoecologist. Uh, anyway, I've worked with him a little bit um, while I was at the University of Melbourne, which I am no longer. Um, but he showed me these amazing core samples that he took um, from the Bolombolom Billabong, which is not too far from here and is a really important cultural meeting place, 
not only for the Wurundjeri people on his lands it is, but also for the wider Kulin Nations Confederacy. And this told a really beautiful story, those calls about the way that we've managed country in the past, what's happening in the present and what could happen in the future. Because through Michael's work, he's able to really show that taking people off country has been the most catastrophic thing in terms of the environment in many places. And he's even been able to show through this work that we didn't have catastrophic fire in Australia before invasion. And in that way, he's also um, overlaid a massacre map in some of his work with catastrophic fire and the correlations are really um, sobering. And I really loved including this as an artwork, even though it's not technically, because it really talks about how important it is to get people back on country in terms of management, how to put people in the driver's seat, but also about how much we have to learn um, and how much we can all benefit from the implementation of Indigenous knowledge and not in an extractive way where it's taken and it's used, which is language that you will often hear in terms of Indigenous knowledge, in a way that our communities are empowered to lead to have the best possible biodiversity outcomes on country. Because without us, you don't have Indigenous knowledge. And that's something I've really been working to try and illuminate through my writings and my work over the last few years. If we are not empowered as peoples, then we cannot have the benefit on country of our knowledge because it sits within our communities. It can't be cut and pasted and that can very much be seen in cultural fire practice, which is different on every different kind of area that it's, it's um, activated on because it's different soil, it's different trees, it's different cultural practices. It's really important to remember that we're really, really diverse and so is our knowledge of country and we hold it in our communities. It is not something that can be just shared or taken or sprinkled on top. It has to come from us to have its veracity and its use of, you know, to get the best benefit from country. I might um, leave it there, but Jim, do you mind just um, flicking through the slides sort of close to the end? I'll tell you where to stop. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not great at time management at the moment or ever. Oh, okay, cool. I might just go through to the end. Um, there should be some pictures out on country. Oh, these ones. So if you just go back, sorry, one June to the, yeah. So this was taken last Wednesday. I was supposed to be um, having a lovely, I'm sure, bottle seed scone with Tanya Pribisek, um, at the uh, after the launch of the State of the Environment report. Um, I was really sad to sort of miss meeting all the people I'd worked with the last year and a bit online. Mm -hmm. But instead, I actually was on my country and I was pretty thrilled to be on my country. And this is... Um, a mob we went out with last Wednesday um, and most of the people in the photo are part of a project that I'm doing with other Bark and G artists and that's going to be at Bundle Place next year from March and part of the project, lucky for us, um, we got some funding to be able to go out on country and that was our second trip and um, if you want to flick to the next slide, June, please. Um, it's some of the most amazing country I've ever seen in my life and it was really incredible to be with um, other Barkindji mob on our country and to all be in such awe and about every 10 or 15 metres there's incredible rock art and we were able to go into caves that our people had sat in and told stories through ochre in their hands and um, it's incredible to be on your own country anyway but to be in a intimate beautiful space like a cave where your people have wanted to tell you something because they put it on the wall with ochre was um, mind-blowing. So I'm looking forward to um, doing more on this project and I am really happy to be curating it with my sister Nikki Cumston and also to be able to incorporate that revitalisation for ourselves within the parameters of the project where it was very, very important to make sure that we had at least two trips together out on country and it's been um, a game changer in terms of how rich I think the show is going to be. I might leave it there, um, David. But yeah, if, if you haven't been to Emu Sky, please come along. Um, we haven't had a huge amount of advertising and it finishes on October 21. I'm August really, 21. August 21, sorry. And yeah, I'm really, um, I'm just so thrilled with the work that all of the artists made and there's over 30 Aboriginal community members involved and there's nothing from the collections. Everything in the show is something that an Aboriginal person wants to tell you right now about their relationship to country. So yeah, it's been a wonderful experience to be able to 
make that platform for people's voices to be heard. Thanks. <laughs> Okay. Thanks so much, Sina. Um, we've got some time. I'm just going to put the stage lights on. Hold on. Is it happening? Oh, it is happening. Yeah. We've got some time for questions. And I wonder, Zena, actually, if I could have the first question. Of course. Thank you. <laughs> um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it was like for you to curate the new sky for the old quad, like the architecture that shot that you had of the furniture with the installation on top of it, yeah. you know, you, you could say was that is, is kind of that colonial structure yeah. to curate a show that's very much about place. You could just talk about the experience of that, you know, managing that kind of history. Yeah, well, I guess in one way it was really wonderful to have such a, um, you know, a mismatch between the ancient knowledge um, of country that's being conveyed and then this idea that it's, you know, old knowledge, the old quad, it's the oldest place at the University of Melbourne. It's, um, you know, the, the, the place where all of those knowledge holders that first came in the 1850s or whatever used to congregate and do their thing. And to have our voices as a takeover of that space was, I felt really powerful and it's um, visually really arresting, especially when you go into this room. And I can't take any credit for this because Jonathan walked in and he said, oh my God, this room is so ugly, you have to use it. Um, and it was a really lovely juxtaposition, but I have to say, um, yeah, I think the technical term for how it is as a space in terms of like trying to put artworks in it is that it's a dog. And it's got like walnut walls and all of these things that are absolutely impossible to navigate when you're thinking about artworks. But I was very, very lucky in that I had one of the best designers available to humanity, um, Jackson Plumley, who unfortunately lost his job in the restructure and I had to really fight to keep him on the show. Um, he was incredible right from the start. He knew the building like the back of his hand because he'd worked there for a while. And all of those problems that you would normally have in a non-functional sort of space for art were very much um, met by Jax's expertise in that space. So one of the first things he said to me was this space does not work with small items. You have to do big things. He said, it's totally up to you as curator, but I'm just giving you my inside information with what I've seen in the shows here in the past. And I absolutely took his advice. And whilst there's lots of smaller things in this work, they come together as part of a big installation. And I think Jax was really right um, about that. But the old quad is an extremely problematic space. It's the vice chancellor's playground. And sometimes they seem really confused about the fact that artworks are in there. Um, our soundscapes were turned off all the time. I rocked up a few times and it was shut because the vice chancellor was having a morning tea with someone or other. And I'd look in and they were looking at artworks that weren't even properly activated. It was really problematic and I think this space, um, you know, probably needs to be rethought as an art space if it's going to remain as the Vice Chancellor's Playground because we need to show the proper respect to artists that we're bringing on board and I found this space really, really problematic and I can speak like this because I don't work at the University of Melbourne anymore and I <laughs> don't have to be careful and in fact I never was in the first place but um, I like to be honest with people. Um, if you're thinking about doing a show at Old Quad, it is a dog and you need um, to really think about the fact that it's very hard to work in, but not impossible because the show is incredibly successful in the space. It's not impossible. You just have to understand all of the, the confines. Mm. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question for Zena? Yeah, well, we'll start with Lou and then we'll go to you at the back. Thanks, yeah. Thank you, Zena. But while I'm sitting this up, uh, taking the coffee and papers, and often shows do move on through the documentation. Mm -hmm. So whilst it might be a dog, Actually, really mm. presented a really fabulous um, bit of documentation, and that goes through all of the slides that we've brought today. Oh, thanks. Yeah, and look, the show absolutely works in the space, and I think people might have a false sense of security about using it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it it does look. I, I'm really proud of the way it looks because Jax is actually psychotic, and he's like has to be perfect, and that was a really great person to work with. He just would not let, allow anything to not be perfect, and for me as you know, someone who's a good storyteller and has um, a visual background in some ways, but has not curated a show like this before, to have a designer like that with me and also the 2D designer, Madeline Critchley, who's also mind-blowingly brilliant and her attention to detail was 
it's just, oh, yeah, it was such a, um, a boon for the show. Um, the documentation is really important to me and I ask for the website to be kept up for at least seven years because I really hate wasting resources. Mm. And a lot of Aboriginal people have written um, beautiful essays for this show as well, which appear on the website. I was really um, disheartened when I was at uni about 12 years ago that I really wanted to be able to quote um, a lot of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in all of my work, but so much of it is behind paywalls in really fancy books. And so I sort of made the decision then that if I was ever had the opportunity to bring people like that together, I'd try and make it on websites or places where people could really access it and be able to quote those people. And so that's going to be a really nice legacy, I hope, if the website stays up, as I've been told it will, for the show in this documentation, but also in all of our voices remaining and lots of the soundscapes that are part of the show are already on the website and lots more will be going on when the show comes down. So, yeah, I agree. It's really important to have that documentation. And yeah, it, um, I couldn't be happier with the photos that Christian Kapuro took as well. And, yeah, I'm really proud that it will live on and it's not going off into the ether after it comes down because that website happened. Yeah, sorry, you had a question. Thanks. Thank you, Nicole. Um, in the like sort of future of contemporary Indigenous practice, like, do you see um, kind of mob going back out the country and creating out there and contributing out there? Or, like, have you ever thought about that yourself? Or? Yeah, well, I guess there's so many um, mobs who are, who are predominantly working on their country. Um, you know, if you look at all the art centres around Australia, so it's kind of, it's happening a lot and always has. But one thing I see is like um, urban Ab Aboriginal people such as myself. Um, I've been really lucky in that I've been given lots of opportunities and I'm very grateful for all of them and I never forget my privilege. Um, you know, a lot of people don't get to have their voice heard and I do a lot and I try and that's, I really try and open up as much room for other people to come and have their platform too in my work. But I think urban Aboriginal people, um, it's kind of forgotten that we need to spend time on country as well. And also um, there's no place in Australia, whether it's urban or remote, that is not an Aboriginal place or up north, a Torres Strait Islander place. We, we have belonging that continues today. And I would really like to see more programs happen for mob in the cities where they get to connect with country. So there should be a range of programs you know, much more than what there is for mob who are in urban areas, because we benefit so much from that interaction with country, even when we're in the city, you know, sitting down at the Birra or spending time together yarning out, you know, in a park. That's that's connecting with country as well. But um, I think we need to think, um, all of us, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander arts practitioners, about how much we give out in terms of our energy and wanting to share and wanting to change how crap things are through that energy that we put out. And I think, you know, it'd be really good if we can start thinking a bit more about what we need to do for our own cultural strength and to reinvigorate ourselves. Because I know myself, I feel really drained a lot of the time. And these times with this, this project, particularly that I'm doing now, going out on country has been a game changer for me. So yeah, it's, um. It's something that I would like to see a lot more like opportunities built in, especially in arts opportunities where you um, can go out on country and do some work in that way. Great. Well, Zena, firstly, um, congratulations. Oh, congratulations on EMU Sky. I mean, if you haven't seen it, you should, you should, you know, give yourself some time to to just, especially for people at the university, that it's actually at the university and it, mm -hmm. and it generates this really beautiful sense of place. Oh. Um, you know, congratulations and thank you on behalf of the university staff. And um, wherever you are, either in Federation Hall or um, in Zoom land, please thank and acknowledge Zena's generosity today. Thanks. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me.